Hello and welcome to the Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you by Opal, a proud sponsor of Irish Rugby. My name is Jessica Woodlock and I'm once again joined by former Irish international Hannah Tyrrell. Hannah, it's been confirmed this week that Greg McWilliams is to step down from the Irish women's rugby team. What was your thoughts when you heard the news? Um, yeah, I suppose slightly in shock, um, but also not surprised at the same time, given the results of the team, you know, and this is the first time Ireland have gotten the wooden spoon and come last since, I think, 2004, 2005 season. And, you know, and unfortunately uh, for Ireland, it, it was not the tournament uh, or the results that we'd hoped for. Um, but I did think that, you know, and, and all we've heard from the RFU is that this is a transition phase, that we are building momentum and um, to lose a coach. And, and Greg's only been in, in the job 18 months or so. And, um, you know, that is a bit of a blow, I suppose, to the development of this team, because when you get new coaches in, I suppose they want to put their own style of play on it. And they have, you know, certain players that they think fit the mold or the style of play that they they want to, to go by. And you know, that could really shake up the d dynamic of this team. And, and yet again, we might feel like we're back to square one and starting to build all over again. And that's not something that we can, um, I suppose, afford to do. We're already bottom of the pack and we don't want that gap to widen anymore. And, um, you know, I did think that the RFU and Greg would um, try and give this at least another season to see, can we build on that momentum and can we develop the team the way they've talked about uh, the way they've talked about for the last uh, couple of weeks or so and as you mentioned he is only in there 18 months but what sort of impression or typically you'd say like legacy but in this case it's so short like what sort of impression does he leave behind yeah look I, I, I do think it is hard to leave a, a legacy per se uh, when you are in the job such a short space of time you know I think he only covered the one Six Nations tournament so five games and then the, the two uh Japan games in the summer series so it's very hard to leave a massive imprint on that team but I think one thing he did try to do was unite all his players and give them a sense of belief um, you know in their own I suppose abilities um, was it enough time for him to actually uh, put his own spin on things I'm not sure um, I'm sure um, we would have seen a lot more from this team if we had a, a whole other year under our belt of this professionalism we really only had those players in from a full time perspective from November and um, but I suppose a lot of those players will have very fond memories of, of Greg being their head coach a lot of them would have gotten their first cap under him you know and, and given them their first opportunity to wear an Irish jersey and they'll be forever grateful and indebted to him for that and um, but for now you know it's up to the RFU to make sure that they get someone in that role that um, you know is fit and right for the job and um, because it is a tough task ahead of them to get this uh, Irish team up to speed and get them to a position where we can actually start competing again. And who would you like to see in there? Um, like, I, I'm not entirely sure uh, who would be best fit for the job, but I do hope that whoever comes in is very strong-minded. There is a lot of negativity and pressure around the RFU and this women's team at the time and I suppose there's been a lot of complaints or disgruntlement around how this team has been run. And, you know, and that's not just from a head coach's perspective. That It goes above and beyond that. And uh, you need to have a lot of open lines of communication between the boards and the RFU and all the staff that go around it. And then also, you know, whatever coach comes in, that he picks the right coaching staff around him to get the best out of their players. And one that is very open and... Uh, is looking at a really wide net of players regardless of whether they're playing in Ireland, whether they're playing uh, in England or beyond, whether they've previously played for Ireland and haven't been in the setup for a while or, you know, those players who maybe previously turned down um, a full-time contract. I would hope that we use every player available to us, you know, because we need uh, some experienced players to try and return to the fold and, and help bridge that gap that we've had. So whoever it is, I, I really hope it's, someone who has experience of women's rugby, uh, both either playing or coaching previously, because that is something that I think has been maybe lacking um, over the past couple of years. Um, and someone who has a, a huge understanding of the game, but also is willing to stand up to to uh, people outside of um, the actual kind of coaching side of, of women's rugby and, and be able to, to put their own stamp on it and, and not be... Um, I suppose not be pushed aside or be be quietened a little bit by maybe other forces out there. 
And there's been a lot of discourse and discussion on Twitter saying, you know, nobody will take that job. You know, it's curse. It's too tough a job. Do you think that that will be the case or, or will someone want to step in and, you know, make those big changes that probably do have to happen? No, look, I, I wouldn't want to say that it's cursed. It's not a cursed job. It's a great opportunity for somebody to step in and show their own abilities, you know, both on and off the, the pitch. Um, I just, as I said, I think it, it needs to be somebody who has uh, women's rugby, you know, their best interest and has experience of that and that, you know, to to coach a national team and, and the senior women's team in Ireland, it would be a massive honour for a lot of people. And I'm sure there'd be a lot of people willing to put their hands up. It's about getting the right person in the job. And uh, I think a big thing coming into it is that people need to realise our expectations. And, you know, I, I said this at the start of the tournament that I thought, you know, a really good result for us would have been three, uh, three wins in this tournament, targeting the three away wins. And maybe I realised that we were a little bit too far off. And so you have to adjust your expectations and, you know, whoever's coming in obviously wants to do really, really well, but has to realise where we're at now, um, you know, and that um, it will take time to build this team up to where we really want it to be, to where it's competing against the best team in the world and that um, that's not going to happen overnight. And we have Lynn Canwell coming into the IRFU. What difference is she going to make in there, do you think? Well, look, look uh, I never got to play with Lynn Canwell, but, um, you know, I was around kind of when she was, uh, at the tail end of her career and I've um, heard nothing about but good things about her as a player having watched her as a player and um, you know she was a fantastic centre and um, you know and a really really good leader and um, since leaving and retiring rugby she's been involved um, you know with uh, South Africa's director of rugby for there for them and has done fantastic things but she has massive massive knowledge of the game and she's someone who obviously haven't played women's rugby to an international standard being one of the best players uh, to ever pull on an Ireland shirt um, and now also has the the experience outside of that from a coaching standpoint um, and beyond you know it is only a really really positive step for Ireland uh, and for the RFU and the way forward because she will make sure that the right things are implemented to get this team going forward and um, you know and she could have a massive impact. So the Six Nations finished up last weekend with England being crowned Grand Slam champions what did you make of the match it was quite close in the end yeah, I called it, um, I thought it was going to be really close. I thought France would really put it up to England. Um, and uh, it wasn't looking that way in the first half. England absolutely came out the blocks flying. France looked like they were still at home. Um, and, you know, by halftime, I was thinking, uh-oh, like it was 33 nil, I think. Um, and I was like, this is going to be a disaster. France haven't showed up, but... It just shows this English team are absolutely dominated by some world-class players, you know, and then they still have an awful lot of players to come off the bench and do serious um, serious damage as well. But in fairness to France, they didn't give up. They kind of woke up and came out firing in the second half and they made it a close game. You know, only five points in it at the end. I, I thought that Tremoulier in her very last game for France after 78 caps and um, played really, really well at 10. Vernier, for me, uh, best centre yeah, in in the tournament so far, probably one of the best players for me in the whole tournament. Uh, really stood up for her team and dragged them back into it, scoring a try. And uh, Cyril Bane on the wing, you know, got a try at the last minute, more of a consolation, but she fought really, really hard for her team. And, um, you know, I just wish that France had have gotten into the game a little bit sooner. You know, England, their big players stepped up. Marley Packer as captain, led the way with a try. Alex Matthews was fantastic in the back row and player of the match, Sadia Kabea, was... was Phenomenal. She really capped off a wonderful tournament for her. Um, but, you know, France just left a little bit too late and England showed their might and it was a fitting send-off for, for Simon Middleton. You know, that's England's 19th Six Nations title in all. They're fifth in a row. Um, they're number one team in the world, you know. And while France did come close, I would have liked to have seen it. Um, you know, it was a game of two halves, really. Um, England won the first one 33 nil, and France won the second one 33-5. So I, I wish... France had it kicked on a little bit sooner. We had a real competition on our hands, but it was only kind of tense for the last few minutes because of that. And what sort of legacy, you, you mentioned it there, I suppose, but what sort of legacy does Sam Middleton leave behind? Oh, look, uh, a phenomenal coach, you know, numerous titles, World Cup, uh, getting to World Cup finals. You know, he has been a, a phenomenal leader for them and he has developed some players. They've come through the ranks and, um, you know, he's been lucky enough that this English team has been professional for a while and he also has come across some players who are, you know, generational talents. Um, but to 
get them playing the rugby the way they are. And I think what was really good about Simon Middleton is that he picked out England's strengths and in particular their mall has been uh, phenomenal for them over the last number of years. And then when criticised the last year's World Cup because, you know, everyone was saying England only have a mall, that's where they're scoring all their tries. They came out this year's Six Nations and scored tries in every other aspect but the mall, you know, and they still had that um, mall strength or that, that damage to do in their back pocket when they needed it most. But uh, he has just been phenomenal keeping these players, I suppose, happy but competitive because when you have a squad of players who would probably get into most teams in the world and um, you know you have to be able to keep them happy and all getting regular game time and he was able to rotate and adapt to squads you know he has varying styles of play but he manages to get the best out of his players and he'll be sorely missed by England and I'll be really interested to see who they get in off the back of that. And France and England have for years finished in those top two positions England ahead and then France coming in second when do you see that change in or do you think that's a pattern that's set to continue at the moment? Uh, look, I do think they'll be the top two teams for the next few years, but um, I've no doubt that France have the ability there to actually go on and win a tournament. I'm sure they're sick of being runners up at this stage. Um, you know, they last won in 2018 and they were worthy winners then and they still have some uh, world-class players and, and uh, a lot of youngsters coming through and a lot of depth, but... Uh, I don't see why they couldn't go out and win a Six Nations last year. As I said, they, they ran England really close this year and they didn't turn up in the first half. So imagine if they were a little bit more consistent and, and playing really good rugby from the first minute. And then a 36-10 result between Wales and Italy. Uh, a well-deserved finish for Wales, do you think, considering the campaign they've had? Yeah, look, uh, Wales have been by far the third best team in this tournament, you know, and um, that that's... No slide on them for that. Uh, they demolished Ireland in, in the first game. You know, uh, they, they beat Scotland and they comprehensively beat Italy to, to solidify that third place. And they, they deserve that um, tier one status in the WXV tournament this year. They have used uh, their professional contracts to really good effect, starting off with 12 in the very first year and then upping it to 24. And again, they've managed to keep a squad that are... Um, experience and older players who've been around a, lo a long time but they've been able to introduce a lot of younger players uh, into the fold and really bringing them up to speed and, and they're playing some really good rugby in another team who again play to their strengths their scrum is really dominant uh, their line out is really dominant and then they have a couple of players who just have a bit of X factor uh, that they can you know get something out of it when they need them and um, they're fully deserving I've no doubt that they're only going to improve and, and continue to hold on to this crop of players and they'll be targeting the World Cup of 2025 for a, you know a top five top four finish I'd say and what did you make of the Italian performance in the game uh, I suppose my big gripe with with the Italians is that and I've said it all all tournament is that they're not consistent and um, you know they they lost out to Scotland last weekend uh, in for me what was somewhat surprising and then they they, they came into this game and they got blown away and they never really got the upper hand on Wales and couldn't really get back into it. They have some phenomenal players, um, you know, and one player who, Sarah Bartin, she made her 116th cap at the weekend for Italy and then announced her retirement. She's been a phenomenal player. I think she's been involved in this Italian squad for something like 18 years, which is incredible, but they'll, um, they'll miss her massively for her leadership and her role on and off the pitch and she was a captain for years with them, but... Uh, Italy need to start using some of these young players coming through and getting them up to speed because they definitely have potential there. It's just their consistency that's an issue. And moving on to Ireland then, their loss to Scotland meant that we finished bottom of the table for the first time, as you mentioned earlier, since 2004. What did you make of that match? Obviously a disappointing result. Yeah, um, I watched that match with uh, a little bit of nerves, to be honest, because I wasn't entirely sure how it was going to go. Scotland were coming off the back of a really important victory against Italy and they have some phenomenal players that were doing really well. And um, Ireland got off to a brilliant start, kicking the penalty and taking the points uh, by Dana O'Brien. And it was a really good decision because it's something that we'd failed to do um, you know, really well. And, and uh, it got us on the board and it was a really nice confident start. But... You know, once again, our mistakes just started to creep into us. We had all the possession and we were doing all the really good stuff in the first half, but in the end, we failed to execute on that and, and couldn't do the damage that I was hoping we could do and blow Scotland out of the water. And that came, you know, back to bite us in the second half. And even though at one point it was 10 all, we capitulated after that. And uh, Scotland scored a further three tries um, after that to effectively kill the game. And 
you know, I don't want to take away from Scotland. I think they were brilliant. They had some fantastic uh, team performances or individual performances. Chloe Raleigh for me has been a standout for them all tournament. Um, Lana Skeldon at Hooker has been phenomenal. She's been a very regular try scorer for them. Uh, and then the, the, young, the youngsters coming through, Meryl Reese in the centres and Francesca McGee scored two wonderful tries for them uh, that knocked Ireland for six. And we just couldn't get into the game. And from an Irish perspective, it's just disappointing how we collapsed. We had very little impact off our bench. Um, you know, we had no real go forward. Um, and it seemed like once Scotland got the their third try, or sorry, their second try to go ahead and make it 17-10, it's we just fell apart and, and it was like our heads were gone and we knew that we weren't going to win that game and we lost a little bit of that fight uh, that we normally had. Um, and yeah, it, it was a really tough watch and uh, knowing that we were going to lose this game and that um, we were going to come last. And, you know, it's not what this Irish team deserves uh, from a player point of view because they really have put in an awful lot of effort over the last number of weeks. But I don't think this team was adequately prepared for the level of competition they were going into. I don't think that the, the Celtic Challenge Cup was at the standard needed to prepare us. And I don't think the AIL leagues, no matter how well uh, it was at the time, it's not to the same standard as other European leagues like the Premier 15s. And that all had a knock-on effect that we were underprepared and we weren't uh, we weren't ready for what was coming in the Six Nations and it, it accumulated in, in poor performances right throughout the tournament. You are watching the Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, a proud sponsor of Irish Rugby. And what's the solution to that then? Like, this is a, a last place finish for these players. Is it a matter of a structural sort of overview, as you mentioned, you know, revisiting the AIL and looking at that or... Or what would you like to kind of see be implemented before next year's Six Nations? Yeah, look, I don't think it's an easy fix. Uh, this is going to take time, I suppose. And that's something that people have to realise that, you know, uh, come this WXV tournament, we're all of a sudden not going to be a, a world-class team. Uh, we need time to embed practices and skills and roles that we want these players, um, you know, to get them up to the standard that is required. And Hopefully come uh, next Six Nations, we'll be in a much better place uh, because of our year, extra year of professionalism. Within that time, obviously, uh, I'd love to see um, the the AIL standard improve massively. Um, we're not exactly sure what the reform uh, is coming with that, uh, but there are some proposed changes. It's just yet to be finalised. The same with the WXV tournament. We're not entirely sure where it will be held, when it will be held, who's involved with that. Um, and what the standard will be, but um, that will give us opportunities to give players game time. Well, not at the standard that we would hope to be truly competitive. Um, you know, players can use that as an opportunity to try and show their worth. And for me, it it all boils down to club structures and um, I suppose resources that are given. Uh, people talk about investments. The RVU are investing in women's rugby. It's just what are they doing with those funds? I, I'd love to see. Um, where those funds are going exactly to um, see what developments are being made. But I, I, I would hope that the RFU are going to come out and give us an overview or an, a, an insight into their plans for the next couple of months because I'm sure they're in crisis mode at the minute and they're they're uh, wondering how they're going to kind of take the next steps to, to make us improve because we can't go through another season where we've come last in the Six Nations Championship. That's just not good enough. And this year there was a host of new players making their debuts, making their first caps, ones that we wouldn't have come across last year. What players from this campaign did stand out to you? Obviously, not the result for the team, but from an individual performance perspective, who stood out? Um, I don't think it was her first cap, actually. I know it wasn't her first cap, but Durban uh was a bit of a revelation for me. Definitely up there in the top three Irish players this tournament. Uh, every time it was needed, she stood up, she gained the hard yards, she made the hard tackles, got really good turnovers, um, you know, and there wasn't a game where she, she was quiet, um, you know, and I thought Aoife Dalton at 13, playing in a very difficult position, did really, really well, um, you know, she got her first cap um, last year in the Japan Series, but it was her first Six Nations tournament, and you know, when you're playing in a team where defence is, uh, you're defending an awful lot of the time because you can't hold on to possession, you know, she was under a lot of pressure and she stood up quite well. Um, and another player, not her first cap again, but had been out of the game for 18 months with injury. I thought Lauren Delaney did really well when she came back in for the last couple of games. Um, 
you know, particularly that last game against Scotland, she really took it to them. And uh, I saw a stat that she had the most metres made of any player uh, in the whole tournament in the last round, you know, and I, I thought she did some really positive things and solidified that backfield where we were probably struggling with inexperience a lot. And the Six Nations came out and named who they thought were their breakthrough players. Dervla Nicovard got a mention. Others included Sadia Kabea. What did you make of her performance? Yeah, Sadia Kabea, she's been around a long time with England, but their um, their strength and depth in that back row has been phenomenal. Like, you know, Sarah Hunter's just retired, which is probably um, given Sadia Kabea an opportunity to get in there alongside Marley Packer and Alex Matthews. But she has um, incredible uh, strength and physicality. She's really, really hard to take down. And she has a little bit of speed about her too. And she, she brings a really nice balance to that back row where... You know, uh, Marley Packer uh, wouldn't be the fastest player, but really, really physically strong and aggressive. Um, And Alex Matthews, probably a a mix of the two of them. And she was really, really good at the weekend and well-deserved her player of the match. But this is probably her breakout season and she's going to go on and be a staple of that back three for England or that back row for England for the next couple of years. And from Wales then, we've heard a lot about her, only 19 years old, Tupelutu. What did you make of her this season? Yeah, to Bluetooth, she definitely announced herself on the big stage, uh, winning player of the match in the first two rounds uh, of the Six Nations. Obviously, Ireland got a, a full account of her in the, in the very first game where she got a try against us and absolutely destroyed our str- scrum. But she is a big physical girl who is well able to carry in and well able to put in a big tackle. And she's going to be the cornerstone of that uh, front row for Wales for the next couple of years. And the scary thing is she's only 19. She's still only learning. Uh, she's only going to grow and get better and her strength is only going to improve um, and she's going to be a, por- a force uh, for Wales and uh, she'll be a world-class front rower in, in the next couple of years. And then Francesca McGee also got a mention as well. What did you make of her? Yeah, Francesca McGee from Scotland. She uh, broke Irish hearts at the weekend with a, a wonderful solo try right towards the end uh, to put a dagger in the hearts of those Irish players and solidify that win for Scotland. But you know, uh, Scotland have been blessed with uh, some very, very impressive back three players over the years. And I really thought that uh, with Rona Lloyd gone to uh, GB7 this year, that they'd be uh, really, really missing her. But Francesca McGee slipped in on the wing there and played phenomenally well for them over the last couple of games. And not only a really good attacking option for them, but she's fairly solid in defence too. And as I said, really young player. She's only going to get better. And lastly then, they named Melisande Lawrence, obviously from France, as a breakthrough player. What did you make of her? Yeah, she was brilliant. She got two tries uh, last weekend um, against Wales and another product of this uh, French team who just continued to uh, introduce these youngsters who seem to, you know, slot in seamlessly and and get on the end of these tries when the French are at their best. And uh, she's another player who's got an electric pace and uh, their back three is a really solid back three. They have Boulard uh, and Bane there and she was able to learn from them. And um, the best thing about this French team is their mix of experience and youth. So it allows those youngsters to come in um, and learn on the go, but learn quickly. Um, and she's slotted in really seamlessly. And the French have this knack of just finding these wingers who manage to to score a couple of tries every tournament and do a job and, and not miss a trick. So you already mentioned Dervla and Nicovard, but if you were to put two other players in there, what would be your top three players from that Irish team this tournament? Um, look, while it was a very disappointing tournament, there were a lot of players uh, who really tried their best to stand out. I thought Nicola Friday led really well, uh, but for me, Sam Monaghan puts in a massive shift every game. Probably doesn't get the plot that she deserves because she doesn't get on the end of scores. Um, but she was phenomenal, hitting rocks, making tackles, big carries. Uh, I think she had the most offloads in the tournament as well. Um, and she, yeah, she's been phenomenal. And then Aoife Dalton for being her first Six Nations, you know, playing in that pivotal position. I thought she did really, really well. A couple of half breaks in some games as well. And I, I can't wait to see more of her uh, as she develops and grows as a player. And if you had to sum up this Six Nations for Ireland, how would you sum it up? Um, look, I don't want to be like too negative in this, but like disappointing is, is definitely the word. And, you know, that's maybe that sounds really harsh, but I suppose people would have come into this tournament um, assuming that we were going to be a lot better than we were. And so it is disappointing to find us at the end of um, or at the bottom of, of the Six Nations table. Um, the only way is up from here, you know, and I hope the RFU sees that opportunity uh, to help us grow and develop um, because... At the minute, women's rugby as a whole worldwide is on its way up. And, 
you know, looking at England and the crowd they had the weekend, you know, 58,498 people, I think it was, at a, a standalone game, a world record is absolutely phenomenal and the women's game is moving in the right direction and the RFU needs to get women's rugby in Ireland moving in that direction too. And what's next for the Irish team? We mentioned last week we have that new tournament coming in the autumn, but what does the next couple of months look like for this team? Yeah, look, it'll be different for, for different players, um, you know, but uh, the girls will go off and uh, take an extended break. They'll have their off season. I'm sure they'll have holidays or, you know, uh, whatever else planned that they've given up for. Because you have to remember the last number of weeks have been huge sacrifices uh, while they've been off playing for their country and, and missing out on so many things. So they'll just enjoy being back home, a bit of downtime. Uh, after a couple of weeks, they'll still be officially in off season, but they'll probably have their own running and a bit of gym work and stuff like that to do. And then at some point, I suppose, towards the end of the summer, they'll start going back into pre-season and, and starting to build up for either the women's AIL tournament uh, season that's about to start or the WXV tournament, both of which we haven't got any solidified plans about where or when uh, they are happening and when they're on. So it'll kind of be determined once we get more details on that. But for now, the players will be enjoying it a well-deserved break uh, away from rugby, which is really, really important, uh, not only physically, but mentally as well. Um, and hopefully they come back renewed, refreshed and ready to, to get going again. And in the past, we would have typically around this time seen some retirements, people hanging up the boots. This is obviously a much younger team, but would you expect the majority of that squad to, to be there again heading into the next round of matches? Yeah, look, I would hope so. Uh, I can't speak for any of the players. I uh, I do know that uh, one or two were thinking of heading off travelling. Um, I think Molly Scuffle McCabe is heading off to Australia for a couple of months. That's not to say, you know, she won't be back in time for the WXV tournament or for the Six Nations. Um, you know, there might be other players considering um, if they can, you know, if they want to play international rugby again after that or if they you know, felt like that's enough for them. But I'm sure the majority of that squad who are young and got a taste for international rugby only want to get better and improve and, and pull on that jersey again. And hopefully they've inspired a couple other younger girls to start picking up a rugby ball and further down the line, we start to see women's rugby grow in Ireland. And it hasn't been confirmed yet exactly what's going to happen around Greg McWilliams with Yara. If you have come out and said, you know, they're in talks, he is expected to step down. When can we expect a new coach to come in? How would that typically work? Um, again, I presume they will go through a process of um, figuring out who's out there and who's interested in putting out, um, you know, a, a call to say that we're looking for a new head coach and interviewing applicants and deciding who's best for the job. And I'm sure that goes through the board and, you know, the, the various staff at the RFU. RFU um, but that'll take a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months. And um, so I can't imagine that'll happen anytime soon unless we have somebody maybe already within the RFU just stepping into that role, then it might be a little bit quicker. And there's been rumours then, well, not rumours, but mentions, what if Simon Middleton was to go into that role? Could you see him going in? Would I like him to go in? Absolutely. If you can see what he's doing over uh, over in England with uh, the RFU and that English team, absolutely. Um, I do think whoever takes on that job has got a very big task on their hand. And as I said, we have to have realistic expectations of where we're at and where we want to be you know, this time next year. And um, yeah, it'd be great to have Simon Middleton in there. I don't know if it's going to happen, um, but who knows? And before we finish up then, it's actually nearly like deja vu discussing it because this issue we would have discussed way back when we had that letter come out with players, but Ireland's 2018 targets, which were set, targeted a win in a championship, top three finishes, and for the team to qualify for the World Cup. None of those were obviously achieved. So two questions, I suppose. First of all, do you think they were too ambitious goals? And secondly, will we see accountability for the fact that all of them resulted in failures? Um, I don't think they were too ambitious, to be honest. Uh, in 2017, Ireland, um, we didn't do too well at the last World Cup and we failed to qualify and therefore that led to us having to qualify in the years uh, just gone by. But... Uh, in 2017, we competed for a Grand Slam Six Nations against England uh, in the RDS, you know, and whoever won on the day would have won the Grand Slam. And, you know, we competed then. So I, I don't see why in 2018, when they came out saying that we wanted to win Grand Slam, that that was too ambitious for us. Uh, 
you know, qualifying for the World Cup was definitely within our sights. And, you know, we only lost out on that by a conversion in the end. And, um, you know, and our our finishes the last couple of years have left a lot to be desired. And um, I don't think they're too ambitious. I just think that we failed to invest and get the right structures in place a couple of years ago um, to help us achieve those goals. Um, you know, looking at them now, if those goals were to set out now, are they too ambitious? Absolutely. Um, you know, we need to take this one step at a time. Um, but it's definitely something that we should have as a goal for the future. Uh, a couple of years away, we just need to build on on where we're at now and go from there. And will there be accountability surrounding those targets and the fact that they weren't met? Yeah, look, I hope the RFU will, will be reviewing the most current Six Nations campaign, but also, you know, the last kind of 18 months or two years as a whole and seeing where they've went wrong and, you know, looking at the, the professionalism and the contracts and, and seeing have they got everything right there or are there, are there some tweaks that will, that will improve that a little bit. And I would hope that there's a whole review of process and that people will put their hand up and say, yeah, look, we didn't do it right. We're not perfect, but here's the steps we're going to implement to make sure that we get ourselves on the right path and, and moving in the right direction. So as long as there is that, um, you know, that's all we can ask for for now um, is steps to get us in the right position, people in the right positions to get us moving that way and people with experience of, of women's rugby in Ireland and what it's like both as a player and as a coach and people who have our best interests at heart. And we mentioned in the first episode, those sevens players, it's a crucial year for them with sevens. But were they a loss to this Six Nations campaign? Could we have done with the likes of Bevan Parsons, Amy Lee, Murphy, Crow? What What's your thoughts surrounding it? Yeah, look, absolutely we could have. Who wouldn't want, uh, you know, world-class superstars like uh, Amy Lee, Murphy, Crow, Bevan Parsons, Stacey Flood, you know, Lucy Milhall, Eve Higgins? Who wouldn't want them in your team? Absolutely would they have improved? If, yes, they would have brought massive amounts of experience playing on an international stage. You know, they've been in similar positions <coughs> before. Um, but... The fact is we didn't have them and we had to manage without them. And I suppose that challenged our depth a little bit. And while that, um, from a result point of view, didn't work out for us, it did allow a lot of players to come in and, and get their first cap and figure out the standard needed for international rugby and hopefully give them a hunger to go off and improve and be better to get back into next year's squad. Um, you know, and um, again, the Sevens program have, uh, you know, their own important tournaments this year, qualifying for the World Cup and or for the Olympics and, you know, next weekend, they have the biggest weekend of their lives in, in Toulouse, in the France Sevens, where basically, you know, if they finish ahead of Fiji um, and Great Britain, they qualify directly for the Olympics, which has never been done before in the history of women's rugby. So um, they had their priorities this year. And while it was unfortunate, um, you know, that it clashed with the the Six Nations, um, you know, everybody knew that that was happening and it gave other players an opportunity to step up and it, it was a challenge, but, you know, it is what it is and we didn't have the the depth uh, at the time to be able to to deal with that effectively. And in one year's time, if we're sitting here, you know, discussing next year's Six Nations, what would you like to have seen changed and been implemented over the next year? Well, I would hope that um, from an individual point of view that all of our players improve, you know, technically from their skills um, and their set piece and all that sort of stuff. And I would hope that our structures uh, have been worked on and that we've had a coach that has implemented fairly early on so that they get a really good amount of time working with this team. But I also hope that we have, you know, an outline plan from the RFU about where this team is going and the investment and where investment is going and a season plan for the WAIL where, you know, it's not going to change every year. We know that our players are getting good competitive rugby week in, week out that gets us to the standard uh, needed to be able to compete at international levels. So basically just more competitive, more confidence, would you say, for players and then an overall, hopefully, some wins under our belt by this time next year. Yeah, and, and backing basically, uh, like by the RFU, to back this team, back whatever coaches in to make the right decisions regarding selection and how we play and how this team is going to be run, you know, and not have it run by um, a board that has very little experience or involvement with women's rugby, that it's people who are involved with women's rugby in Ireland that are involved with this national team and helping us move forward. And um, we'll leave it there then for this Six Nations campaign. So that's all from us. You can get involved with the conversation using the hashtag, hashtag HerSportSixNations.